please, please take your seat so we can get started. Time is a funny thing. There's the time of the physicists, which is strange and unintelligible to laymen. There's the ordinary common sense time of clocks and calendars. I personally find this oppressive. Time passes at the rate of one day per day, and I object. <laughs> then there is lived or experienced time, which stretches and speeds up and twists in ways that are not easy to describe. Uh, professor Weissman, the Anthony Giddens Professor of Sociology at the London School of Economics, will talk to us this morning about um, technology and time. Thank you very much. And she will keep to time. She always keeps to time, I have to say. Um, I, I want to as well say that it's a wonderful, I'm having a wonderful time here. It's a very ambitious project. Um, that RISE has undertaken to have such an interdisciplinary conference. I think it's exactly what we need to be doing, and I'm very happy to participate in it. And actually, coming at, um, I mean, my take on these issues, and I'll be covering some of the issues that other people have discussed, is um, one of time, the lens of time, and I'm very interested in the relationship um, between technology and time, because I think that at root, a lot of the things we've been discussing, actually, are about how we want to spend our time, how much time we want to spend working, how much time we want to spend on other aspects of our lives, and what role technology should play in this. And I feel like I'm coming at a very good sort of point in the conference because um, one of the things sort of Deborah mentioned, and I was very in tune with her, was about technology being designed for time saving and, and whether this should be the ultimate goal, and I'm going to argue that it shouldn't be, but also, um, that Joel this morning said that if there was anything different, it was the speed of innovation, that speed is now seen as central to these things. Um, and I want to raise um, a lot of questions about that. Actually, it was terribly tempting at this point to ditch the whole talk and start uh, <laughs> criticising other people, but I'll do that en passant, as they say, as I go. Um, so anyway, I uh, uh, used to be called an industrial sociologist when there was uh, industry. I'm now a sociologist of work and employment, and I was very much brought up on Marxism and Fordism and the labour process and thinking about the role of technology in increasing productivity by setting the pace of work. And actually, I was very influenced by economic historians and the writings of people like E.P. Thompson and the discussions about how central, actually, the mechanical clock was to the rise of the factory system, how it embedded a particular kind of time in the factory system in which work became marked and measured by clock time. That is what work was about intrinsically. And what that economic history um, really taught me was that the character of time changes with history. And why is that? It's because actually clock time, the entire concept of the hour, is itself a historical construct. That it's something we've got used to um, in the last few hundred years and it's become associated with a particular form of economic organisation which we call capitalism, in which time is money. Actually, I did have a, um, a slide about, I have to say that I've tried to put in a few slides because Moisha, I know, is very keen on slides. As you can see, it's not my forte. But um, this was my ex example of the centrality of clocks and timekeeping to uh, 20th century uh, work. And so if we had to really describe um, what the quintessential experience is, if you like, the time consciousness of the 20th century, I would actually describe this as a linear chronological clock time, that that's what was embedded in this kind of system. And it's actually against this background that I've become really intrigued by the fact that everywhere nowadays we hear that time is speeding up. Um, innovation is speeding up, time speeding up, the pace of everyday life is faster than it used to be, uh, and whether it's uh, speed dating or speed trading, we're told endlessly that the world is moving faster, and that's why you know, we have to make these new adjustments, because we're in this accelerating world, and it's a world in which we have more and more devices, and yet we seem to have less and less time and we're told now that time is at a premium. I think this is interesting, and I will 
come on to this. So at the core of these theories of acceleration, this notion of acceleration, is the idea that actually if digitalization is changing how we live, how we work, um, how we conduct our relationships, then surely this will have a great effect on our subjective experience of time, how we feel about time. And actually, this is precisely um, at the core of a lot of social, contemporary and cultural theory. This notion that somehow we're living in a new time of acceleration. These are a list of um, different social theorists, but they all have different um, conceptions of this. They're all assuming that somehow digitalization means that we're living in timeless time, instantaneous time, network time, uh, even I time. People like Manuel Castells actually talk about um, us being in a new epoch in which time disappears and that we're seeing the end of industrial uh, clock time. And these sentiments are actually expressed so often and so commonly that they're rarely examined. I think they're completely taken for granted. And so what I very much um, wanted to do today was to examine these assumptions. I want to uh, examine this claim about the acceleration of life, um, of everyday life in digital capitalism, and ask whether the pace of life is really faster, uh, what's the role of technology, and how do we account for this paradox that we have more and more time-saving devices, and yet we feel like we have less and less free time. And in the second half of the talk, I want to explore the ways in which robotics and automation more generally embody our desire to save time, to free up time, to delegate labor, and to make time for important things. Robots promise to fulfill roles that are currently performed by people, to actually serve us in a service economy. But what I want to argue is that engineering still assumes that we all share a standard clock time and that this assumption both frames the way in which automation is done, but also, um, you know, I'd say it's a moral order. It's become a moral order that actually limits how we might think about automation. So they're the themes I want to sort of elaborate in the talk today. Uh, but first, let me say a bit about the relationship between technology and time, which is the um, subject of my recent book. Uh, I came into this work during the microelectronic revolution, uh, where we were supposed to uh, be entering a leisure society, and we talked about educating people for a leisure society. And now I find myself in this digital age, and the talk is now of busyness, of time poverty, of time scarcity. And the iconic image that abounds, and this is from The Economist, is this of the harassed citizen. Always their head down on a screen. Um, all these machines, um, they're supposed to make our lives easier, and yet we're all pressed for time. Uh, the pace of life's accelerating. More and more technology and less and less time. And I think how we respond to this is that we, we, that we vacillate, actually, between blaming these technologies uh, for our feelings of being pressed for time. And on the other hand, thinking that more technologies will be the solution. This is the sort of paradox I want to explore. Now, if we believe the cyber gurus of Silicon Valley, all of this speed will make our lives better. We'll be able to do multiple things simultaneously, faster. There are time-saving technologies for everything, a technological fix for absolutely everything. And the apps, as you know, are, apps are endless. And um, I'm often giving these talks, and it turns out that everyone's wearing a, a self-logging bracelet or watch or some kind of monitoring device uh, that will help them um, manage their time and free up time. And in Britain, we're actually behind. We've just, um, you know, Alexa has just come onto the market. And there's lots of talk about the wonderful things this personal assistant with, will do for us. Um, and a Guardian journalist um, who was reviewing this last week said, she is just Siri on a stick. <laughs> but people are lusting after her, calling her a wanton temptress. It's all marketed for a busy life on the move. And actually, in preparation for coming here, I read um, Stanford University's report called 100, The 100 Year Study on Artificial Intelligence that's just come out. And I thought it was very interesting because in this report, it says that exercise apps will soon not only propose a schedule for exercise, but also suggest the best time to do it and provide a coach. 
And I think this is very interesting because actually it would involve making moral judgments about priorities. It's as if the, the messy business of everyday life is somehow amenable to algorithmic improvement. And in response to this, hardly a month goes by without books coming out like this. I have to say um, to Diane that I tried to, I keep up not only with the books on robotics and all of, you know, da -da, I was buying every single book on busyness, distraction, time poverty, and, I, and actually I can't possibly, it's just a complete mountain of these books all the time um, on this. And in all of these books, this whole genre, Hyperconnectivity is blamed. That's what's really um, the problem. Um, and according to Tim Wu, who's one of the, the uh, better um, authors here, um, who you may know because of his work on net neutrality, he is now saying that attention is the main resource for business. That this is really, you know, the, the 21st century business thing is attention. That the problem is that all of this media is actually distracting us, taking our attention away. And actually, it's a very good analysis in that book because he talks about how new media have also always been trying to get us to watch ads, but now the new system is that actually we get all this free stuff and we pay for our time. And it's a lot of time. He calculates that Facebook's 1.7 billion global users spend an average of 50 minutes a day on Facebook sites and apps. I mean, Cathy O'Neill's um, new book says 35 minutes a day. I don't know how people make these calculations because I'm a time budget expert, so believe me, I know it's hard, but let's go with him on, his, on the 50 minutes a day. And he says, which I think is interesting, that the compensation is lousy. He has calculated that we users are being paid a rate of 60 cents an hour for watching ads. And so he says the problem isn't just that attention's become a commodity, but that we're paid very little for it, that it's very undervalued, and that attention is very precious, that we should recapture it and not give it away so cheaply. And the solution in a lot of this literature is that we go on a digital detox, a digital diet, go off the grid. I didn't even know what this meant when I first went to a conference and a young man <laughs> said, I went off the grid. Um, you know, and, have a, and go back to a sort of more natural state of life. And of course, capitalism being what it is, there are now whole organisations that deal with this. This is a Californian company called Digital Detox. Uh, you arrive for the weekend and you put your phone, you know, as you go through, they take your phones and <coughs> technologies uh, off you and they're locked away for the weekend. And what I really loved about this when I looked it up um, was that their tagline is disconnect to reconnect. I mean, is that intelligent or what? I just thought it was fabulous. They asked me at the end to put my email in so I could stay in touch, which I absolutely didn't do. But I can't help wondering how many of the people who go on these things go back on their Facebook on a Monday morning and boast about the fact that they lasted a whole weekend um, <laughs> without this technology. So seriously, the first thing to say about um, a lot of this discussion about technology and time is that it is very technologically determinist, and we've heard a lot about that. Um, in the last couple of days. This notion that we're somehow hostages uh, to these machines, victims of this sort of logic of acceleration. And the main message of this recent book of mine is very much to claim that this compulsion of speed, this imperative to speed, is, a, is as much a cultural artefact as it is a technological one. That the fact that we feel so pressed for time, that we feel so busy, is because of priorities and parameters that we've set ourselves. It's not to do with technology per se. So let me just explain what I mean. Um, I find myself here, I mean, I'm somebody who helped develop the Social Studies of Science and Technology, or STS, what we've been trying to do, and obviously we've succeeded, given the talks I've been um, hearing um, this two days, is to very much argue that technology isn't neutral, it's not autonomous, it doesn't drive itself, that technology is always social, embedded with political um, and social um, values, um, and that really we should think about technologies as crystallizations of society and think about the way they shape us, we shape them, that this is a sort of mutually constitutive process. And I sort of use that to then try and think about time and to argue that we actually 
only sort of experience and understand time with and through our machines. We actually make time with our machines. And so what I um, argue is that it, it's really a mistake to think that we're somehow living in some age where everything is accelerating, as if there's some overall drive towards acceleration. I think this sort of view gives much, much too much power to technology, and it doesn't really think about um, what everyday temporality is like. It doesn't really think about the social and political context in which people have these experiences. And too often speed is discussed as if we all have the same experience of speed um, but, and, and time, but also as if time is an individual resource rather than a collective accomplishment. And I think these two um, points, uh, the idea that we don't have the same experience of time but also that time is not individual but collective, have a lot of implications for how we think about time and work and for the project of robotics. So let me just sort of elaborate. Um, one example that I often use is information overload and email because I've done a lot of research for decades looking at uh, managerial and professional workers and actually how they use their email, their phones, their sets of technology. And I'm very familiar with the endless um, estimates there are about how much uh, time is wasted on email and all those silly studies where they get students in labs and see how long it takes them to refocus after they've been interrupted. I mean, there's so many of studies of this, one doesn't know where to begin. And I go to lots of conferences with geeks who are designing better and better email filter systems as if this is a technical problem with a technical uh, solution. And I was recently at a conference in Washington and I was talking about time and at the break, um, all of the CEOs came over with their electronic calendars um, proudly and said to me, well, you know, time is the big issue in Silicon Valley and, you know, these calendars are just fantastic. This is what's... We're working on these. They're going to be even better. We'll have solved the problem of time with these calendars. And I think to myself, well, I'm not sure that they've actually got the right idea. What I actually found in my research was that the need to respond to email quickly isn't to do with the speed of data transmission. It's not to do with how many emails you've got. It's to do with cultural norms that have built up about appropriate response times. And if you look in organisations, you find that people at different levels of the organisation respond rather differently. And this is, unsurprisingly, about power relations, that some people are able to resist 24-7 availability much better than other people. And I like to hear compare the policies of some German car makers that unfortunately some of the other things they've been doing is not, are not, you know, it's Volkswagen and Daimler and there's lots of problems with some of the other things they've been doing. But I have to say that some of these companies, and it's because of strong works councils uh, in Germany, have actually introduced policies about email so that they've banned work email at the weekend. Uh, there's the one you've probably heard because everyone loves it about um, when people are on vacation at Daimler that an email comes up actually saying um, the person you've emailed uh, is away, your email has been deleted. If it's important, email them again when they're back from vacation. And I think it's worth thinking about, about that in comparison with this book that you pick up in the airport, um, How Google Works. And in this book there is actually a section called overworked in a good way, right? I mean, don't get a lot of laughs in America, interestingly, for this. You do everywhere else in the world, actually. <laughs> overworked in a good way. And in this section, um, Schmidt and Rosenberg say that work-life balance policies are actually insulting to smart employees. They have worked with young mums and they go completely dark for a few hours in the evening and then around 9 p.m., the emails and charts start coming in and we know we have their attention. Now, this highlights another aspect of time, which is that time's collective and not individual. Because actually what these parents are doing in the evening by logging on is that they're dealing with the very difficult task of scheduling. And people have referred to this a lot in terms of changes in work patterns. But this problem of scheduling is a very big problem now. I'd say because actually most people now live in dual earner families, which they didn't used to do, and also because we're living in an era of what I've referred to as 
hyper-parenting, that the expectations of the amount of time you spend with children has never been higher than today, although the discourse is all about the fact that we don't spend enough time with our poor children, that actually there's never been a time when people have spent as much time. And what people want is not just more time any time, they want time with other people. They want quality time. And you only have to ask the unemployed to really understand this. I think there's a terrific study comparing um, the unemployed and people who are, who are employed that shows that actually both groups look forward to the weekend, the unemployed and people in work. And that's because at the weekend, friends and family are available to socialise with. So that in sociology, we actually talk about this as time being a network network good, that its value really depends on being able to share it with other people. People are actually happier, to go back to um, one of the values that um, Deborah was talking about, they're happier when they have time with other people. And so we actually live in a period in which there's an array of social differences between how much time people have, how their time is valued, how their labour is valued, and that some people's time is much more valuable in this society than other people's time. And actually, some people gain their speed at the expense of other people being slow and doing a lot of waiting and doing a lot of work. And so I'd say that a lot of this discussion about time is much more a discourse than a reality for lots of people. But even though this is the case, we're constantly enjoined to work on our individual time. And now, actually, having a good relationship with your time is equated with having a good relationship with technology. If you're managing your time well, then you're, you know, you've got a handle on a range of technologies and they, they, you're using them to maximise and manage your time. So does it matter, then, what kind of machinery we've got? I've been very much stressing that this imperative of speed is cultural and not just technological. Well, I think it matters a great deal because I actually think that our idea that somehow we're going, that the faster we do things, the more we're going to save time is constantly fed by innovations. And I haven't got time to go into the history here, but in my book, um, so I didn't, all right. Um, <laughs> But, it, but I, um, in the book, I very much argue that we're in a period, actually, in which speed has somehow become identified with progress, um, with inventiveness, with productivity, with efficiency. It's the ultimate measure of progress, and that I think this very much informs um, an engineering, what I'd call an engineering mindset, a sort of instrumental philosophy, um, which I think still lies at the heart of engineering, artificial intelligence and robotics, in which the latest, the fastest and the most automated is seen always at the best. And, I, and what I've been trying to do in my work is actually at least to raise some questions about whether the best technical devices are always about maximising efficiency in the sense of being economical with time. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not nostalgic um, for a less, um, you know, digital world. I haven't joined any of the slow food movements, slow science movements. Actually, if you look it up on the web now, there's slow reading, there's every, there's every kind of slow movement. Actually, um, just sort of anecdotally, I, you know, I can't help telling you this because I think it was absolutely extraordinary. The BBC, um, a couple of years ago, actually had a whole day where a canal boat was going up a canal. Did any of you read about this? Anyway, it was slow. Yeah, a canal boat was going along a canal at its speed, and you could put on um, the television all day on the BBC, and you just you were on the time of the canal boat. So there has been a whole wave of slow culture um, as an answer to this speeding. Uh, huh? <laughs> Right, I actually thought it was very interesting, but you know, we can, we can <coughs> um, debate this. And I'd also like to say that I'm a great fan of household appliances. I absolutely adore my washing machine, my dishwasher, although I have to say that even here, and I've done a lot of studies on this over my sort of long career, the relationship between these machines and time isn't straightforward. Actually, there's a lot of work that showed that these technologies do as much to raise standards, actually, as they do to simply save time. So, 
if it's a subject of another lecture, but I'm trying to say that the relationship between technology and time is rather complex. But what I want to go on and talk about um, now is actually this quest for a humanoid intelligent machine that we've been sort of talking a bit about and a kind of machine um, that will not only, not only sort of serve us, but now all this talk about a machine caring about us, uh, interacting with us. And it's not just the sort of possibility of this um, that I want to talk about, because I've got doubts about how possible it is, but whether it's desirable, do we actually want um, these kinds of machines? And I think it's interesting that we're now in this period where there's a lot of talk, and I mean, um, we heard it sort of yesterday about these machines actually acting, uh, interacting, having relationships with us, even having emotional intelligence. Uh, this is just sort of one example of these machines, and I do want to use the example not of cars but of nurse bots, but I'll be making some of the very um, similar points in a way. But I think it's interesting that a lot of these robots are designed actually in a sort of anthropomorphic way. They're given these kinds of characteristics um, to be appealing to us. And uh, there's loads of these um, Tamagotchi pets, and they're in, lo in lots of old people's homes. There's lots of experiments now about the cuddly, fluffy, um, lovely pets and how they'll make people happier. And in all the advertising, you see photos of people looking very old people, uh, looking very engaged. Um, you know, with these pets, what, what you never see, what you only see actually at our science and technology conferences where people have done studies of these things, is that um, after a little while, actually, people get very bored with these things and that there is, and if there isn't an aid um, somehow facilitating this, what you actually find is a photo that you never see on the ads, which is the pet just sitting there passively and people passive and no interaction going on. And actually, I was in... Um, Uppsala recently, and a young researcher, I can't even remember his name now, unfortunately, said to me he'd done a study of this in one of these homes. And he said that actually the people who really loved these pets were actually the nursing aides because they could use them as a way of distracting people. But it wasn't like that the elderly actually were sort of very engaged in these things. And so I think it's interesting why scientists spend so much time actually designing uh, cute, cuddly animal robots. Um, they're often um, children and usually a boy, and when it's an adult, it's almost always female. I have to say that when I go to these sort of conferences, there's often a robotic head or whatever, you know, and um, it's usually Sheila or Barbara or um, someone that we're looking at. And actually, the one I was at Berlin, um, in Berlin recently, um, which was funded by uh, Audi, but was actually a very interesting discussion. The, um, the group that had designed it were very proud of the skin and we all had to go over and touch the skin because the skin was just fantastically soft and, you know. Um, you know, I think this may seem innocent enough, but what I'd actually argue is that making these machines recognisable approximations of human life forms actually plays a really central role in legitimating this whole project, that they're part of the legitimation pro project. And the fact that these robot creations are given names like Asimo and Pepper is an attempt actually to give these robots individuality, personality, to sort of facilitate our sort of projection of our emotions onto these things. And when you think about it, names like Asimo and Pepper, they're actually corporate brands. They do have a history, that's, that's what they've got, but we think of them as somehow personal to us. Now, I'm not a psychologist and I don't understand why um, humans are so uh, susceptible to feelings of attachment with machines. I've read loads of uh, research showing how children and even scientists, apparently, who design these things feel bad in the evening going home and leaving the machines uh, there because the machines might feel lonely. We do seem to have this incredible capacity um, for projecting emotions um, onto these machines. But I'd argue that the language and metaphors of artificial intelligence are actually playing a very powerful role in persuading us that these machines are acquiring human capacities. Yet artificial neural networks don't learn like we do. Cognitive computing doesn't actually think. 
Neural networks are not neurons, but this language, I think, is purposefully saturated with anthropomorphism. And in science and technology studies, we've talked for a long time about the cultural work scientists need to do to get us to accept technologies that we may find threatening, that might be throwing up questions about what it is to be human, what it is to be machines. And I'd argue that some of the speakers we had here yesterday were doing wonderful cultural work to persuade us of um, the wonders of these technologies and how we should embrace them. But look at, um, look at this one, Pepper. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences where the manufacturer, South Bank, brings along Pepper and tells us that Pepper can engage in conversations, uh, read emotions, and move autonomously. And the chief executive, Mashio Son, described Pepper's launch as, to quote him, a baby step in our dream to make a robot that can understand a person's feelings and then autonomously take action. We are putting emotion into the robot and giving it a heart. Now, all this Japanese promotional material talks about the fact that these robots are going to be able to babysit, do housework and elder care, and free up time for sociability. And when I read these things, I think it's kind of ironic, because actually, where is there a bigger problem with kids being on screens um, than in Japan? And I think to myself, well, maybe they'll save time. They'll put these robots in here, give people more time, and actually they'll spend more time on their screens rather than sociability. I thought, you can't control what's going to be happening with the time. And I think seriously that we should think um, very hard about having uh, nurse bots, domestic nurse bots, um, or mobile robotic assistants looking after the elderly. I think this does raise um, a lot of very uh, difficult questions. I absolutely understand that they can help with physical uh, work, do a lot of monitoring, that there's a lot of fabulous developments in telemedicine. But I think we need to always remember that some of these physical tasks that the robots are taking over have always been uh, an opportunity for social interaction, for social engagement. And that when this living labour is replaced by dead labour, this opportunity is stripped away. And in fact, the elderly are reduced to a standard universal model that has universal needs. And let me tell you that unless you do this standardisation, the robots won't work. So the standardisation is part of the automation. And what I would argue is that caring time, actually, is a particular kind of time. It's a, it's a time that can't be speeded up, that can't be accelerated, that's fluid, that is open-ended, and that actually doesn't fit with the rigid clock time of machines. In fact, caring tasks are often fragmented and woven into other processes rather than being discrete tasks. And just as an aside, because it annoys me, and I've got just two minutes to say this, I mean, we are endlessly um, having the statistic quoted um, to us from the um, Oxford guys, who I know very well, Frey and Osborne, who I can tell you can't believe their luck that people take their um, algorithm seriously, that 45% of all people are going to be automated. They're, you know, particularly Osborne is really embarrassed about it. Sorry? 47%. 47%, okay. <laughs> And I mean, there's been very good critiques of this, showing that, that, you know, that the algorithm looks at task. It's the crudest notion of what a job is and what a task is. Um, and, you know, and this was done in a rather frivolous way and has now become repeated as a, um, an axiom, as if it's um, a, a serious issue. Um, I would argue that there's lots of kinds of work, and particularly care work, that actually demands slowness, being there, forms of intimacy that can't be automated. And that we're really in danger, it seems to me, of conflating caring as a behavior with caring as a feeling. And um, Sherry Turkle has put this um, better than anybody, I think. It's, it's that machines can take care of us, but they don't care about us. It's not actually a relationship. Now, for philosophers, and we have an eminent philosopher here, um, the issue is not so much whether the robots are capable of doing this, but whether it's unethical to attempt to do this. And I've read some papers about this by philosophers who very much argue that even if people are happy with robots because they believe 
the, um, in the robots, that they've got a relationship with the robot, that the problem is that this is a form of deception. Now, I'm not a philosopher but a sociologist of work. So I put it to you that if elder care was revalued and highly remunerated, like, say, coding work, programming work, artificial intelligence work, the putative labour shortages in this work would disappear. Um, and I would also put it to you even more radically that if we designed households and cities so that we didn't actually relegate elder people to separate spaces isolated from other people but integrated them into civil society, that might also be a different kind of solution than a robotic solution. But such thoughts are way beyond a lot of the discussions I go to about everything having a technological solution. So to conclude, I think actually, and I take, I'll just give me a few more moments to conclude, um, I actually think that, that the robots of tomorrow, like science fiction, tell us much more about our social relations today than they actually do about the future, that you can read off our social relations from these images of the future. And, and that this discussion now about robots having communication skills, emotional sensitivity, are very much what you would think a discussion of these things would be, living in a service economy where this kind of work predominates. And the discussion is all about having to do these things at an accelerating pace, because time has never been at such a premium. We're supposed to employ every moment as wisely as we can. And this cult of productivity, I think our obsession with busyness, constitute a moral order. It's as if it's an unquestioned virtue of our age that makes it very difficult to step back and think about what do we want robots for? Uh, do we want them to just save time? And I think in the back of people's minds often is this romanticised view that we are really going to have personal assistance to do all of these things for us. It's as if we all want to live in Google, where I'm told on the campus everything's taken care of, the dry cleaning, the exercise, absolutely everything, and we can, we'll all be able to have this robot, we dream of this robot that will clean, cook, encourage us to exercise, monitor our sleep patterns, and even know how we feel before we do, which is what the, a lot of the algorithms are working towards. And in this context, as I said, I think it's very hard to step back and think about what purposes these robots might serve. And I think it's made all the more difficult by the fact that actually our visions of the future, our sort of utopian visions now, are so shaped actually, I think, by the discourse of Silicon Valley that we can't even think about alternative futures, alternative utopias in a good sense, without thinking of them in fundamentally technological terms, which is what we're scripted to do. Let's think about the future right. Let's think about car, you know, self-driving cars. Let's think about particular kinds of technology rather than thinking about alternative social relations, rather than thinking about what sort of society we want. And also thinking about how do we want to measure progress. I mean, is progress actually to be equated uh, with the fact that there's hundreds and thousands of apps I mean, on a bad day, I really do think to myself, what are all of these apps for? Is this the height of what we can do, you know? Um, and I also think that we should think very seriously about, and again, various people have referred to this, about how important work is. As, uh, and as a sociologist of work, and I've worked on work all of my academic life, I'm very aware of the fact that work is a source of meaning to people, it's a source of identity, we had a whole phase in sociology, unfortunately, uh, where uh, there was too much focus on consumption and that people would get their identity from consumption and style and their blue jeans and their shopping and the whatever. Let me tell you that this has come full circle and we are now very concerned, uh, like you are here, I mean, we think about the north of England, about the effects of deindustrialization about the on the on whole communities and on, all, and on people having a sense of identity. And I mean, people have talked a bit here already about um, a universal basic income, but I have to say, when I think about this, I think to myself, well, isn't it ironic 
that these people who thrive on 24-7 work, who absolutely epitomise the work ethic, who tells us that the geniuses like Steve Jobs have to work 24-7, that these people turn around and say to us, why don't you just sit back and just have a universal basic income? It just seems to me uh, <laughs> extraordinary. Um, the other thing I might say about that while I am still here is actually I don't even take this seriously because, in fact, to have a serious discussion about this, one would need a decent tax system. And we're talking about companies that do not pay tax. So, you know, it's an extraordinary sort of hollow discussion in a way because the discussion is really about what's going to be provided by the public sector, the private sector. How's this going to be organised? And as if these companies are seriously thinking about a redistribution of their finances to a state that would then uh, redistribute outside of that. So, I mean, it seems to me perhaps we shouldn't even put this on the uh, agenda, certainly not in America. I mean, I think the experiments in Finland and some places where there's a decent welfare state, the discussion is much more nuanced and the issue there seems to be whether this would be a way of streamlining welfare system, you know, whether it would be a better way of delivering a welfare state. But that's not um, the discussion you're having here where there's not even paid maternity leave, which, I mean, in terms of time, often I give these whole talks and people say, what do you want to do about it? And I say, well, you know, some paid maternity leave would be a good start in terms of time. Um, and I think perhaps one of the problems, I'll, I'll um, wrap up in a minute, but I think one of the problems is that, you know, and I've been saying this for a very long time, is that the people who are actually making decisions about these technologies, designing these technologies, maybe aren't in the best uh, position to make these decisions for us. Now, I know it's a sitcom, it's a cheap shot, but actually we all know that the people who are making the technologies, designing the technologies, aren't representative of the wider society. It is basically young guys, there are not a lot of women, there are not a lot of elder people, and as I've been arguing for many, many decades, this really does influence the kind of technology we get. And if you don't believe me, you might believe our new superhero in Britain, um, Demis Hassabus, DeepMind, we're now all to worship DeepMind, the artificial intelligence company um, in London, um, and he recently stated, uh, and he goes round giving these talks as well, the sort of talks we had yesterday, he says, technology is a learning system, so inevitably it will bear some imprint of the value system and culture of the designer. And I just want to end by juxtaposing two very different um, images of automation. Uh, one may be um, some male's fantasy of a uh, companionable robot, and the other, which I saw in Barcelona, um, was an artist, a single mother, a painter, wanting to make a bit more time, who um, showed me this sort of robot as an alternative image of, of, of um, a fantasy helper. And so I've, I hope I've convinced you of the need to question what sorts of work are considered suitable for automation and why we have the technology we have. And the hand that rocks the cradle by no means rules the world at the moment, but it could help shape our socio-technical futures if we let it. Thank you. anything in your talk to disagree with at all. I actually was wondering if you could elaborate on one thing, and that yeah. is, you said, talk about time spent together. Sorry? You time mentioned spent, yeah. time spent together. Yeah. And it sort of strikes me that you, that the dichotomy between time spent together and time spent, you know, in front of one's email or one's computer, yeah. that dichotomy may not be quite as sharp as you argue, because yeah. a, a lot of ways in which I spent time together with members of my family is looking at my screen because they, not, they don't happen to be in the same location. So, you know, we may be bowling alone, 
that you know we may, but in fact we may be bowling online, and that chat rooms and FaceTime and Twitter, all these things are ways in which we spend time together. The other issue that bothers me a little bit, and you may want to elaborate on that, is that the way we use time is actually a signaling device toward the rest of our environment, but because basically the busier you are, the more important you are. So you may actually, yeah. nobody, you know, you meet an academic and you ask them, how are you doing? He says, I'm so busy, I don't know where to start, right? Nobody ever says, you know, I'm just looking for something to do. You have a paper for me to read. That doesn't happen. Yep. Yep. Oh, well, I can't hear Yeah, it's all, huh? Well, actually, I completely agree with both of those points. I mean, I was just caricaturing that. You're absolutely right. I mean, what I would say about... Um, I mean, one of the points I make in the book is that I think the distinction between mediated and non-mediated communication is very falsely drawn and that actually people spend most time online with people that they interact with face-to-face. -face. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm some completely um, uh, with you on that. I mean... Where I was a bit disagreeing with you was somehow I, I somehow expected your history of technology to be rather different than it was. And I thought you shifted a bit, really, between the points at which you were stressing how much institutions mattered and that they didn't matter. And one of the things that was left out of your discussion was, in fact, um, the military and military funding of a lot of technology and the role of that institution. And it was somehow, you know, a marker, a dis very much a discussion about sort of market competition without the role of actually huge state subsidy for technology via the military. And that's another reason why I, I'm um, fetching, as you would say, about the tax issue, because the Silicon Valley technology companies have actually relied on huge subsidies through the military, and then they don't want to pay... Um, and then they're very anti-statist, and that contradiction is sort of very rarely sort of brought out. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. This was a really amazing talk. I wanted to ask a little bit more about something that you touched on towards the end about, uh, I believe, the, the, the role of the state. And you describe certain states like, I believe, Finland as places that are already strong welfare states where you said then we can have the discussion about the best way to provide things to people versus uh, in states like the United States uh, where uh, the tax system, we don't, even have, we don't even have paid maternity leave, things like that. My question, though, would be that in the same way that you're very skeptical of uh, the ability of the private sector to have the best interests of the people in mind, perhaps they don't, uh, that it, it seemed to me like the, the, the bit of a solution that I heard to some of these growing problems is essentially enlarging the welfare state and enlarging the size of the state. My counter to that and kind of a question would be, by doing that, by putting in place policies that enlarge the welfare state, enlarge the amount of power that the state could have, could that not also allow the state to misuse technologies like this to cause many of the same problems? I mean, of course there are problems uh, with the state, but actually what a lot of the companies are doing at the moment is spending a lot of time in Europe lobbying against regulation in Europe, lobbying against privacy um, regulation in Europe, uh, lobbying against monopolistic behaviour in Europe. There are huge cases going on. And actually, I'm very worried about Britain coming out of Europe because actually, on the whole, a lot of the most progressive um, regulations, human rights regulations, actually even something like maternity pay, actually, we were very helped in our struggle for maternity pay by being in Europe and being able to use those examples and going to the European court. So it absolutely depends on the nature of the state, but certainly at the moment, I'm very glad that, um, that, that some Europeans are taking on some of the big Silicon Valley companies because that certainly isn't being done here. So that, that would be my answer to that. Can I, I forgot Joel's, I'm just gonna, so that's, yep. Sorry, I forgot Joel's point about the busyness. I mean, you're completely right, and one of the things I sort of talk about, um, <clears throat> and that's what I mean about busyness being a cultural norm. That's what I was trying to get at, that I think we've never been in an age where busyness is so highly valued. Um, and actually, William Gibson said to me, you know, the science fiction writer, sort of said to me, actually, to say you're very busy is the equivalent now to saying you're very rich. Um, and so I... I am trying to sort of counter that notion, but I actually think this... 
But I actually think the sort of this workaholism is, is really promoted um, by the sort of Silicon Valley culture. And I mean, if you, if you open up a, you know, an Observer magazine at the weekend and there are young, young um, you know, the latest young entrepreneurs who floated off companies, they will always boast about the fact that they're working 24-7. Like, it was, is absolutely equated with creativity, genius, all of these things. And, you know, and I go to these sort of hubs, you know, called Second Home, and, you know, various hubs in London I get invited to because they now have evenings of ideas. They like to have people along to stimulate them, you know. And I sometimes sort of say, you know, any crash here, you know? Um, absolutely not. I mean, actually, you know, there are just lots of things that are off the agenda in, with that sort of uh, working thing. And work-life balance is one of them. And, I, you know, I think it's smart to put that back on the agenda, actually. Sorry. Yeah, so I'm from Silicon Valley, and you're right, okay? So it gets hairy when you try to turn a machine from an it to a thou, because it's a thou, T-H-O-U, because uh, uh, an it is exchangeable, but a thou is not exchangeable, right? So it's different things. You, you kind of personify the machine, you humanize the machine, and thereby you're actually dehumanizing people. So that, that's complicated. But I, I thought of just one, one detail. People always bring up Finland, and I worked with the Finns. So I thought of just informing that the reason that they are contemplating universal basic income is that they want Finnish people to work more, not to have them work less. And it has nothing to do with automation. Their problem is that they have one of the world's fastest aging populations. Uh, <coughs> the baby boomers are going into pension. It's a welfare country, and they lost their export industry. So their, their task, if they don't want to, if, if they're going to, they, they're on their way to go down the drain. And uh, the only way they can stop it is to recall the workforce uh, that are going into pension, into active duty, at the same go as they create a new export industry. And this is a tricky problem. So, so you know, I just want to... Finland always comes up, but Finland is a <laughs> different question. So, I, and as for time, I'm, I'm interested, you know, we always think about attention economics as microeconomics. Uh, have you thought about attention economics as macro attention economics? If you have any thoughts about that. I don't know what you mean, actually. Oh, oh okay. So everybody is competing. Can I, but can I engage about Finland, perhaps? Ma oh, sure, sure, sure. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think, uh, you know, the discussion about a lot of the nurse robots is about an aging population. That's the, you know, and we do have this demographic. Um, but I don't even want to say demographic crisis, because it's only a crisis if we actually don't value, if we somehow don't value um, people when they're older, if we haven't got um, the right care arrangements, if people aren't integrated into the community. And I mean, you know, I was brought up as a young um, socialist, uh, very much wanting to shorten working hours. I mean, actually, I've got Keynes in my book. I dream of, you know, a 30-hour week. I would like us to get there. The issue is how we're going to get there, how we're going to distribute work. And people have talked a lot about the polarisation of the labour market. But, you know, there's a huge polarisation of time, that if you look at the labour market, there are lots of people who are working incredibly long hours, and there are lots of people who are working part-time work, shorter hours than they would like, and the unemployed. And so the crucial issue is actually the distribution of work, how to distribute this. And actually, you know, there are quite a lot of surveys showing that, you know, there are quite a lot of people would like to work shorter hours than they currently work and would even take a bit of a pay cut to do that. But it's very difficult to do that. I'm sure you'll know that in discussions about going part-time at universities or anywhere, you know. I mean, I've spent my life actually arguing against the fact that senior management jobs can't be done by a job share. I mean, why the hell not? You know, but we, we just take it, take it as axiomatic that, you know, the best thing is to have professionals and managers working extremely long hours, you know. So I won't, sorry. Um, uh, you um, mentioned a term that many of us 
didn't understand. So oh, okay. Understand. Yeah, yeah. So the, the very quick. Attention, when people talk about attention economics, it is that my time and your time is worth money. And people try to get that in companies. When I talk attention macroeconomics, it's the question from the nation's point of view, what is the optimal uh, sort of uh, spread, optimal distribution of attention across the population? Thank you.